Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. The National Library of the United Kingdom is also home, as you may not know, to one of the largest collections of Italian books outside of Italy. My name is Valentina Mirabella and I'm curator for the Italian printed collections. These are particularly strong in history, literature, visual arts, architecture, archaeology. Our collections of early printed books and futurist books are particularly rich. We continue acquiring nowadays in the humanities and in the social sciences, and we also focus on themes that are relevant today, such as climate change. That's why we're here tonight. As world leaders and experts are gathered in Glasgow to discuss and find a strategy against the climate crisis, it is our job to look at how art, literature, technology reflect on these issues. And we can only start from the archetype, Venice. In collaboration with Phil, the Festival of Italian Literature in London, we bring you some extraordinary guests tonight who will be introduced and moderated by Dr. Giorgia Torfo. Giorgia is a colleague working for the Living with Machines project at the British Library, Alan Turing Institute. She is also a writer, co-founder of Phil and of Phil Productions, who just released the podcast, The Fifth Siren, about Venice. If you have questions to ask to our speakers, please use the chat box below us and uh, they will try to answer them at the end of the talk. Please click on the menu above to provide us with feedback on the event and also to donate to the British Library if you wish so. It's the 12th of November 2019. Evening has fallen over Venice and strong winds are battering the city. The weather forecast predicts aqua alta, an exceptionally high tide. The water is expected to reach 140 centimetres. That's very high, but nothing Venice hasn't seen before, nothing it can't handle. As predicted, at 10.30 a.m. the water reaches the 140 centimetre mark. But it doesn't stop there. A cyclone is approaching the coast. 
It's now patently obvious, this is no ordinary storm. The water has seized control of Venice. It takes over the streets, barges into shops and houses. It swoops up and carries away every object in its path. We shouldn't attribute things to single causes, but the frequency of these events is getting higher and higher. Venice has been hit by recurrent flooding since Tuesday, with 70% of the lagoon... We return to the flooding in Venice, where there has been another high tide today. At least two people have died after flooding reached the highest level in the region for more than 50 years. The mayor of Venice has said that... The Veneto's regional the council rejected a plan to combat climate change just minutes before its offices on the ground... If you're a, a city such as Venice, which is already sinking, there are some really profound implications. ...says it will cost hundreds of millions to repair the damage. The Italian government has declared... A state so should the Aqua Alta of November 2019 still be considered exceptional? Perhaps we should just admit that it's increasingly part of Venice's present, fast becoming nothing out of the ordinary. An equilibrium achieved over many centuries is beginning to shift again, and this time the change could be irreversible. Venice is a city in constant flux. Its built environment sits on wood. Its natural one is the product of human action across many centuries. Paradoxically, for a city like Venice, preservation can only mean constant evolution. The city is like a living organism which grows as it mutates and yet still remains itself in accordance with its DNA, which is inscribed in its own history. The soul of the city, the invisible city, which manifests itself through its visible form, symbolizes this very balance between permanence and change, between the city and its citizens, between the stones and the people. Perhaps, if we stopped thinking about Venice's present as the last possible opportunity to save the city, but took it as a vantage point from which to look to the future, we would start seeing constellations of ideas appearing like stars at dusk. The Fifth Siren is created and produced by Phil Productions with the support of the Italian Cultural Institute in London and Banner Capital. If you like what you heard and want more of it, head to our website at www.thefifthsiren.com. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's event, Venice, Tales of a Sinking City. Um, first of all, thanks to Valentina for inviting us today. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our speakers tonight. First of all, uh, Becca and Louise, uh, Becca and Lemoine, a duo of uh, architectural artists. Um, they've worked together for the last 15 years um, as video artists, filmmakers, producers and publishers. Um, they've experimented with new narrative and cinematographic forms in relation to contemporary architecture and the urban environment. Their work um, has been acquired by the Museum of the Modern Art in New York for its permanent collection in 2016. And uh, their films have been widely presented in major uh, biennials and international curatorial cultural events. Um, among their works, uh, we can mention Homo Urbanus, uh, Barbicania, Tokyo Ride, Voyage Autour de la Lune, La Maddalena, and many more. Sophia Psara? Um, she's a professor of architecture and uh, spatial design at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, I, she has a wide range of interests um, from architectural history and theory to spatial morphology, social sciences and uh, cultural studies. Um, she's uh, written extensively and uh, among her production, we, I'd like to mention uh, two books, Architecture and Narrative in 2009 and uh, the, Van the Venice Variations in 2018. Uh, she has given uh, international lectures, keynotes in Australia, Austria, Brazil, China, and everywhere in the world, pretty much. And uh, so she is a specialist in the intersection of spatial configuration with power relations, uh, but also the spatial and political culture of buildings, among others. Um, we've started this event entering into Venice through a film and a trailer 
of a podcast. And uh, um, that was the origin. And uh, so I think that now we should start from the origin of our works. Uh, Venice is the center, but every time we decide to tell a story, we need to start from somewhere. Uh, city Venice is a city that is facing a, a huge emergency, uh, which is not just the environmental one, but it is also an economic and social one. Um, telling this emergency is not easy. It's clearly not easy, <laughs> um, but not only because uh, it's really hard to talk sequentially about something that is happening at the same time, something that is layered and it's complex, complex and it's overlapping, but also because in the case of Venice, arts, culture and tourism have forced Venice to always show just one side of itself. But uh, Venice is a city that has many faces and many tales can be told about this city. Uh, not just the bright one, but also sometimes the dark ones. All our works, uh, be it a film, a study on literature and architecture, or a podcast have brought to light different faces of Venice, really. And uh, it is from here that I would like to start tonight. So um, I would like to start asking, uh, to, to, to ask uh, Beck and Lemoine about the um, magnificent project called Homo Urbanus, which is a series of 12, 10 films about 10 cities, um, um, which is, uh, as you've described it, a project that invites to observe in detail the multiple forms and complex interactions that exist every day between people and their urban environments. So, so let's start from this project, and I would like to know how you conceived it and why, what, um, how did you choose the cities and why Venice is among them? Hello, everyone. First of all, uh, a warm thank you to you, Georgia, and Valentina, and everyone uh, behind the, the, the scene for these for organizing this event. We're, very happy to take part uh, of it. And actually, we are talking to you from Venice. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's um, a direct from Venice, we could say tonight. It's, it's a dark city, as yeah. you can see behind us. <laughs> Full night. Yes. That's, um, that's true. It's very, it's very dark as a city. Yeah, that's the experience of the night is in, in Venice is magnificent for, for the dark. Uh, but um, yeah, how did it all start? The Homo Urbanus uh, project is, is a large scale project we've, uh, we've been working on for the past uh, four years, maybe, with uh, not continuously, but uh, let's say that we started it four years ago. We call it a cinematographic odyssey because it's, it's a journey around the world through 10 different cities in uh, different continents and very different typologies of cities of different scales, but different also cultural backgrounds, social situation, economic situation, and also political ones. So it's a, there is a great heterogeneity in the choice of cities, but uh, intentionally. And, uh, but let's say that the very central quest of this uh, large project is to understand a bit more or to observe at first who this strange species of the Homo Urbanus is, who we are uh, most of it. And, um, and, and this mostly related to how we relate to space uh, and to public space in, in particular way. The street is really the setting of this uh, series of films. So it's a, it's a project that has a certain lineage, let's say, in, uh, in, in a large um, story of street observers, uh, from, uh, fr from actually, uh, we could think of, of the um, uh, um, urban odysseys of the 1920s in the way they were also observing cities in, in a silent way, uh, also through, through the observation of how we deal with, with the street life from a very 
uh, ordinary and banal activities such as the way we behave in the street, in the street we relate to each other, we, we move and we use, because the, the, we, we give a very central focus and interest in the way we relate physically, our human bodies, let's call them like, like this, how we relate bodily to the space of the city. But also the question of climate is uh, quite central and, and we try to understand how uh, the presence of the natural elements influence also very much the way we uh, behave collectively and uh, how it shapes also a culture uh, around those uh, all elements, impredictable elements or recurring elements. And in the case of, uh, of Venice, obviously the presence of the water and this uh, um, constant um, uh, or rise and, and constant, uh, um, let's say, urgency, which is in some ways and many, uh, most of the time, which is quite well controlled, but there is this constant fear, let's say. Um, I'll start with the origin with Sophia as well, because I would like to, start to know um, everyone's um, intuitions. Um, Sophia, you've written this book, uh, Venice Variations, that moves in a different uh, dimension. It's about the physical Venice and uh, also its literary representation in a way. So it's about architecture and literature. Um, would you like to tell us about this research and, uh, and uh, what inspired this, uh, this research? Uh, yeah, so I would also like to thank uh, Valentina and Georgia and everyone else that uh, is involved in the organization of this very interesting event. Um, I, I started with my interest in uh, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. Um, I was fascinated by the book and by other books that he's written. I, he's one of my favorite writers. Uh, and being an architect, I was uh, really interested in understanding um, the role that Venice plays in uh, invisible cities. Um, as for those that know the book, um, perhaps I'll, I could give just a quick introduction is uh, um, about uh, uh, Marco Polo, the Venetian explorer, describing to Kublai Khan, the emperor of Mongolia, the cities in his own empire. And these are not cities that uh, um, Marco Polo has visited, but they are imaginary cities that he creates in his mind. Um, and he never mentions Venice. So at some point Kublai Khan confronts him and asks him why he doesn't talk about Venice. And Calvino says that, um, uh, sorry, Marco Polo replies that um, uh, uh, memories, images once fixed in words, they're erased. Uh, but perhaps by talking about other cities, I might have lost Venice little by little. So the presence of Venice just once, the mention of Venice just once intrigued me. And uh, knowing that um, uh, the book trace hu takes huge inspiration from cities, I was interested in the relationship between the novel and Venice, and then Venice and these other cities. That's how it started. But when I moved to Venice then, uh, my interest was ignited by the city on its own, and that became a project in its own right. Uh, although it was a lot about uh, seeking the relationship between the novel and Venice, both had to be considered as independent pieces of work at the same time. Uh, so that was the origin of my interest. Okay, so this, uh, like, your introductions have already sparkled so many uh, questions. Um, I would like to start from uh, uh, um, so, uh, Sophia's mention of uh, Italo Calvino and this idea of um, Venice almost never being mentioned in the invisible cities just once we said, uh, but there are multiple representation of the city. So both works, uh, Omo Urbanus uh, and, uh, and uh, Venice variations play with this idea of variations of multiplicity, this idea of modularity, but also like cities around the world and in a way um, like being multiple versions of the way we relate to um, places. So um, this also gives me like gives me idea the idea that Venice, uh, as uh, Calvino tried to point out in his book, is a city that can't really be pinned down. Like it's a city that escapes completely representation uh, 
Um, but you both try to kind of capture something. And um, um, Louise, you mentioned that um, you wanted to like describe, like rec record some moments of the city and how people interact with the city in their daily life. And uh, we know that water is an element in Venice that is um, a sort of uh, ordinary event. But in particular, the chapter on Venice was recorded on a specific day, uh, as we've seen at the beginning. It, is, it was recorded, if I'm not wrong, on the 14th, which is probably the day or the 13th of uh, November 2019, which was one day where uh, there was an exceptional aqua alta. So my question is uh, whether that exceptionality was uh, like something that you just uh, decided to catch the moment or it was by chance? Uh, yes, um, we, we made this film uh, by, by chance, we can say, because we, we, we just arrived in Venice. We, we lived in, in, in Rome before arriving in Venice, so it was two years ago we arrived here and uh, this was a, an incredible event. And so we started to, to film, but uh, uh, immediately we, we understood that uh, this was something very interesting in, in Venice that uh, you can find it uh, always, uh, all the time, that uh, there's a kind of, uh, even, even if the event is so big, it's extraordinary, the, the, the city was uh, creating Im immediately an, a new ordinary, a new ordinary of the city. Because uh, if uh, we, we always say if, if something like this uh, would have happened happen in, in another city, every, everything, even in Rome, for example, we know very well, <laughs> in Rome, everything would have been stopped totally and the city completely blocked. In Venice, uh, as you can see in the film, is not the case. Everything is going on. The show must go on. And it is really a show because uh, every, the life in Venice is a show. And it's like a, a, a big spectacle. No? It's a big show. So we have to, to, to continue. Also uh, economically, because uh, it's, it's so important. Uh, the tourism in, 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 in Venice is so important. So we cannot stop. We cannot stop uh, the tourism. We cannot stop the activity, economic activity, because it's so important. And so, what what was really interesting of filming in the, in this in this film, uh, uh, it was the this this new ordinary and how the Venetian Venetian people, the, the inhabitants of the city, can recreate this kind of uh, new ordinary. And uh, as you can see in the film, everything is is uh, even even the Venetian they they still drink uh, the spritz, no? They they still drink uh, the 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 cocktails. Uh, it's a it's a it's a catastrophe is going on. A catastrophe is going on, but uh, everything else is going on. There's people that are delivering beer, big, uh, big, um, uh, fusti, I don't know, the big, big, uh, the big um, uh, uh, containers of the of beer, and uh, it's, it's rain is so hard. So normally people stop and they start going, going on, going on. So it was really interesting uh, this, I think. And uh, we can see it living in Venice. We can see it uh, uh, all the time. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a high tide, there's water everywhere, but we can find a solution. And finding solution is something typical of the Venetian because they know from the beginning of the city, they know they, 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 live, in a, they live in an exception. Is like, living in Venice is not living like in, in a normal city. You cannot live in a normal city. If you are used to live in a normal city where you have everything under control, you cannot stay in Venice because uh, Venice is changing all the time and you you can you have all the different climates, uh, all different uh, uh, situations that can happen. So you have to be very, very open to find solutions, to find new solutions. And this was uh, really very strong and during that 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 days, and uh, I think we we can see it in the film. Mm, yes. yeah. yeah, maybe if I can add something is that um, uh, actually the real phenomena on those days, and that's very nice. We meet tonight as it's almost the second anniversary of that specific high tide. 
the, the phenomenon have lasted, if I remember well, like one week or so, a long, long period, about many days. And so the film was shot over these various days and there was the, uh, uh, the, the worst, the worst day was probably, I don't know, the 12th or something, I don't remember exactly. But so the film, it follows a little bit the evolution, this sort of uh, escalation of a nightmare. And, and that's why the film is a little bit a, a tragic comedy, I would say, because initially uh, the tourists mainly didn't understood uh, at all the, the real complexity of what will happen. You know, uh, we were all living with unconsciously, obviously, but so in the film, there is a lot of uh, comical scenes because initially uh, these situation of Aqua Alta were seen by the tourists as a sort of additional layer of the uh, uh, of the specularity or the spectacularity of the show, as Ila said. Uh, so you see all these tourists going with their uh, colorful boots around the, the city and uh, walking around with these uh, all a sort of physical difficulty, but they take selfies uh, nevertheless. And, uh, and they are in a way transforming the uh, uh, real uh, catastrophic situation into, yes, into a, a new, uh, an additional um, uh, layer of, uh, of the show, as I said. But uh, progressively through the film, this really transform itself into a, a really tragic situation and, and you progressively understand that, that from enjoying this situation, tourists are progressively trying to escape <laughs> the city, which becomes almost, which are, have trapped them in. So they, they are terrible situation where you see all these um, tons of tourists rushing to the Vaporetto station in order to find a Vaporetto, but there, there are no Vaporettos anymore. And so you, you see that the, there is this sort of shift in, in the, um, uh, in the collective uh, understanding of the situation. Yeah, the, the, there's also something very interesting in, uh, that you can see in, in, uh, in Venice uh, all the time when you have water everywhere, the high tide, but you can see it very well in the film because we film it a lot. It's also this kind of uh, parallel economy that you develop when there's water in the city. So uh, starting from the, the basic uh, thing that is the, this kind of colored shoes of uh, the boots, uh, the boots the, this kind of plastic boots that uh, you, can, you can buy everywhere. So there's a, a lot of people arriving with a lot of uh, new gadgets, new products uh, related to the water. They are coming to the, to the tourists uh, to sell new things. So this is uh, also very interesting as a, as I, I, I told you, it's a, it's a big economy of the show. It's a show, so it's a show. And in the show, we have to sell things. So it's uh, the, the products are related to the, the, the new shows. And the show has to, to change also. Because uh, is, uh, if you can see in the film, there's uh, all the tourists uh, at the beginning, they were, uh, they were very, very happy to see this. So they, take, they took a lot of selfies in the water, the, the feet in the water. So they, it's, an, it's a new event for uh, the ordinary Venetian, uh, the, the ordinary of Venice. And Venice live, uh, lives with uh, the, the events. So it's, it's, it's a big event. It's always a big event. You are in the film. When you, you are in Venice, you, you are the actor of film. If you are a tourist or, or even the Venetian, all, everybody is an actor because you, you are all the time in the picture of other people. You, see, you know that, you know that uh, if you live in Venice, you are in, in uh, I don't know how many photographs of you there's in Instagram because you're, you're, uh, every time you pass behind someone, uh, some, uh, some, uh, someone else or any uh, tourist, you are in the photograph, in the picture. <laughs> so you are part of the show. We are part of the show. We now live in, in Venice and we know that we are part of the show. Even the, 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 the gondoliers, uh, they, they know that they are must, they, they role, their role is much more important to be in a picture than making, uh, uh, guiding uh, uh, the gondola. No? So every, everything is, a, is a, an event in, in Venice. And when you have the high tide or the, the water, is also another event. 
and everything is going on like this. The restaurant they don't close. No, you can you can you can hit a pizza with uh, 50, 50 centimeter centimeter of uh, water uh, and, and the feet in and the water. having your feet in the water. But this is happening all the time because uh, the high tide is not only during that day, those days. Uh, even now, yesterday we we had also a high tide. So there's some restaurant where the the the, the level uh, is very low in the city they don't close they just uh, say to the tourists if you want you you can take this table but you you will have your feet in the water in the water but they they both just uh, before the, the 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 plastic boots so they they say wow that's fantastic let's let's take a let's take a uh, a selfie and, and this is something incredible for Venice because Venice knows this mechanism very well Venetian knows they know very well this mechanism and this is uh, from the beginning is something that uh, the people living here they deal very well of it. We, we say that the best uh, uh, the best uh, commerce com um, commerce in the the, the best match merchant merchant uh, in in Italy is the, the are the Venetian the Venetian because they they know how to take advantage of every catastrophe. That is a, an incredibly interesting uh, description of Venice. Um, you touched upon a couple of points that I find very interesting, and were also the points that uh, um, made us choose Venice to tell our story of the story of global warming and the cities. Um, so you talked, we talked about, you talked about uh, this idea of the exceptional becoming ordinary in Venice. We talked about uh, uh, Italo Calvino not mentioning Venice, but talking about Venice all the time. We talked about Venice being a show all the time and uh, like the, the, the water and the environment becomes a uh, a sort of uh, element that you know it's catastrophic but people adapt to it uh, as if it wasn't there which is a really powerful metaphor of what is happening right now so in a way venice is a is a, a metaphor um, of our contemporary times and how we people live in this world but it is also a cautionary tale because things are kind of uh, uh, move faster in Venice and we can magnify all these relationships between tourism, uh, capitalism, the environment uh, and everything. It's really a place where all of this is played out uh, right in front of our eyes very clearly. And, and uh, I, find, I, I really like the, the uh, description of how Venetians adapt to um, all of these uh, events to the Aqua Alta as if you know it wasn't there it becomes part of their life um, I would also like to, however to like swap the narrative now and see whether Venice adapts to in, to the inhabitants the city in, in, um, adapts and uh, while we discuss just the contemporary times now I would like to to go back in time a little bit and ask Sofia more about her study on the evolution of Venice and uh, uh, reading your book, uh, Venice Variations, uh, you start from an intuition that you had about connections in Venice and how the city has uh, um, um, evolved over time. And I would like you to tell us a bit more about this. Uh, yes, um, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it's uh, really interesting to look at the urban form of Venice uh, because it really encapsulates a pattern of evolution. Um, so. Uh, using certain methods um, by computer analysis, um, I have analyzed the network of Venice. And what emerges out of this analysis is a fascinating uh, finding where all the squares are really interlinked into a network of pervasive centrality that permeates the entire city of Venice. Um, and why this is really a trace of the evolution, evolutionary history and the social and political history of Venice is because we have to go back many, many, many centuries ago when Venice was starting emerging in the lagoon. Uh, it consisted of these uh, um, islands, an archipelago in the lagoon, and its island was uh, had a semi-autonomous um, capacity. So with time, as the Venetians grew with trade and became more prosperous, they started reclaiming land and the islands joined together. So 
um, with the compact form of the city emerging, a NALI system had to be introduced in order to facilitate connections between the islands uh, using the canal system and having another system superimposed onto the city, which was the alley system. So whenever there was a, a need for a connection, whenever there was a need for a bridge, these bridges were built in a way that they connected all the squares of Venice into this network of uh, centrality. Uh, so the underlying property is that the squares are the nodes in the two networks. They connect the two networks together and it makes sense because when the alley network did not exist, uh, the, uh, serviced, the, the islands were serviced, uh, the squares were serviced by boat. Uh, so when they were connected with the islands, they had another level of connection as well. Of course, there are other connections throughout Venice, but these connections, in the, the, the role of the squares as, not in, as nodes in the network are very, very important. And they were uh, community centers. Uh, the islands were semi-autonomous. They had a pa patron saint. And uh, even when the city became a compact city and continued evolving and being transformed, the fundamental urban unit of Venice was the island. And the inhabitants of the islands had a, a very close attachment to their islands and their neighborhoods. And uh, to the point that uh, there was at some point a conflict between the communities themselves and the emerging state. Uh, so there was an interesting dialogue and conflict between the, the state and the republic and the semi-autonomous communities that uh, was dramatized uh, through the ways in which the rituals were played out in Venice. Uh, so that was a combination of morphological analysis that really told me one type of story and then historical research that was uh, more or less showing how the networks of Venice um, were capturing exactly that conflict between the uh, parochial uh, identities in Venice and then the powerful state and the empire emerging um, uh, at the end of the medieval times. Um, so this was the main story of the analysis. How this relates to Calvino is another story as well, which uh, is interesting to discuss if the discussion comes to that point. But I'll stop here. So in a way, uh, like both your work, the videos and uh, um, um, an academic uh, researcher are pointing out that Venice and Venetians, although the word Venetians is to be defined, um, are a sort of unique entity. So this integration between the city and uh, people who live in the city makes a unique component that evolve over time. Um, do you think that your works, like videos, art, literature, can tell us something about Venice that hasn't been told yet. This is a quite a tricky question. Uh, I, I, I think we are not the best ourselves to, to answer that. I mean, we could answer probably from someone else's work. Um, uh, our intent in, uh, as, as Ila said initially, this film was actually not very much planned ahead but a, a more uh, an intuitive uh, reaction to what was happening. So we felt the need of documenting and observing what was happening on those very days. And then it became, or we edited it later on, uh, including it in the Homo Urbano series. But initially it was not like a scientific, scientifically planned or so. But um, I think uh, what, what this film maybe brings um, is, uh, is the observation of, of the normal daily life in the city and, and this con conflict or this paradoxical relation between uh, normality and, and anormality or exceptional uh, situation of this, uh, this moment, uh, historical moment. But um, yes, it's, it's more uh, a minute kind of observation on, 
on on how we we move behave relate to each other in the city so because probably um when we look at films that were shot in venice they uh, obviously i'm not talking about fictional films there there has uh, there is a long history of fictional films but mostly documentaries would take a very specific angle in dealing with a uh, very specific issue on the contemporary life of the city but uh, on the country this film was more um, looking for bringing this this look upon our as i said initially real physical relationship with the space of the city and how venetians and tourists are two sort of um as as you said initially the the word venetian is complex to define because actually i would say more uh inhabitants of venice and the tourist tourism which are like two realities overlapping every day or mixing and trying to avoid each other every day and so uh, the film observes both uh, those human reality uh, realities in their uh, coexistence and and what was really uh, touching living these days of, of uh, exceptional high tide was to rediscover a sense of humanity a generosity a, a sense of solidarity which in normal times had totally disappeared i mean um, you had like uh, taxi drivers suddenly becoming incredibly generous and helping uh, people in uh, in need because uh, initially when we talk about these days we 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 mention mostly the uh, tragic comedy and the uh, the way uh, tourism or the the economy of tourism grasp the, this event to take advantage of it but there is also in the worst days uh, we have to say that it, it had been a, a real catastrophe economical catastrophe for many families here and and so we saw very uh, interesting situation of local solidarities among uh, um, various inhabitants and and which is quite rare i would say so uh, yeah, in every, I think it's comparable to what happened also in New York uh, in the 9-11 situation when suddenly the rules of these distances and anonymity in the city are broke, uh, are broken by a sudden sense of catastrophe. And, and this is really important to feel that behind these sort of stage behavior, suddenly humanity rises again um yeah i think that like both words um homo urbanus in particular the chapter on venice because that's the one we are talking about but also venice variations are different ways uh of portraying venice um which is very slippery it's a is a very slippery term and uh we keep on mentioning calvino in a way or another and uh um I would like to ask uh, Sophia about this uh, as well, because uh, I have the impression that from what we are saying is that like this idea of all these representations that we have of Venice, it's like humanity, the catastrophic um, uh, event of, and inhabitants being totally untouched by it, but also tourism, all these spaces are like the different cities that Calvino might have written in Invisible City, even if we know that Calvino hasn't lived in Venice. Um, Sophia, what, what was Calvino for you? Um, yes, I think that um, a very a strong theme in, the, in Invisible Cities is the ways in which cities evolve and their capacity to survive in a way. So evolution is, very, is a very strong theme. And obviously he had in mind Venice as a sinking city when he wrote um, invisible cities, I think in 1972, uh, I believe that uh, the first uh, alarms about the future of city must have already um, gone off. 
Um, so the theme of evolution and what cities need to survive is really strong in Calvino. And if you read the cities one after the other, you understand that there are cities that uh, struggle to retain their existence and that there are others that manage somehow to evolve and adjust and adapt. Uh, and city and Venice has been a, a very adaptable city over the years. We know that it was called La Serenissima because it was inviolable for 1,000 years. And that meant that uh, it wasn't really conquered by any um, uh, foreign power um, until Napoleon put an end to La Serenissima. But at that point, uh, there was an, a way in which the city revived itself and really produced a new image and a new myth because the the most serene republic was a myth uh, that the city had created about itself. And in the 19th century, when the writers of the Industrial Revolution um, and of the Grand Tour arrive in Venice because of all these modernizations, Venice recreates itself as this new myth about the decaying city, the decrepitude, the lost empire, uh, which gradually is transformed in the 20th century into the festival city, the exhibition city, the, the tourist city. So from uh, an inchoate collection of beliefs and legends in the medieval times, it becomes the most serene republic in uh, the 15th and 16th century through the work of the Venetian humanists, then the decaying myth, the myth of decay, the lost empire, and then the festival city, the city of culture. So what the next stage of Venice is going to be and how the city can reinvent itself into this next stage, which is perhaps one of the most vulnerable stages in its history is a really interesting thing, but it should learn from its past and to come with a new myth a new way to actually uh, define itself in order to survive. I think that's a very strong concept in, in Calvino. And if you read the last dialogue with Kublai Khan, it centers on the question of utopia. And uh, um, uh, Kublai Khan says, where, where are the concentric circles constantly leading us, implying Dante's hell, which is formed architectonically as an in inverted pit. Uh, based on circles. And Calvino says that my utopia is made of fragments separated by intervals, and the intervals are the dialogues that uh, um, Polo and um, Kublai Khan have with each other. So his solution is try to find small um, ways to intervene rather than come with a grand utopia um, to the question of uh, cities and their survival and their future. And this uh, sort of uh, quick overview of how Venice has changed over time is really interesting, like from, you know, splendor to decay to the city or like the show. And uh, again, um, um, I will just mention that the podcast uh, you've uh, heard the trailer of at the beginning. We tried to explore all of this um, uh, over time because like Venice is a city that is in constant change, is con constantly adapting to, to the circumstances that um, it finds itself in. Um, and we end up with the last episode, which is called Evolution, which is about uh, this idea of evolution. Like there's always this idea that evolution is towards something better, but like perhaps evolution is just a adaptation, you know, rather than change is um, I, I actually the idea of preservation, because this idea of preserving everything, perhaps we should rethink preservation. Preservation is probably preserving the idea of adaptation rather than stiffness. Um, I can already see some uh, questions from the public, but we will we'll go to that in a moment. I would like to just uh, uh, get to an, an end of our conversation because I'm I'm conscious of time. Uh, we've mentioned this adaptation, and you mentioned uh, very rightly utopia. And again, we go back in a way to Calvino. Sometimes I think that literature has a sort of special power. Mm -hmm. But I would like to ask you, Becca and Lemoine, um, the pandemic and Venice, everything stopped. Was there a moment where this utopia of this Venice? empty from tourism was uh, kind of thought as not possible, but like glimpsed in the background. And uh, I have another question related to this, uh, where if you hadn't uh, already filmed uh, Homo Urbanus on, in 
2019 on that 13th of November, would you have done it during the pandemic? <laughs> have you thought about uh, doing anything on that in that period? Because again, it was uh, it was exceptional for the entire world, really. But uh, I think it must have been pretty ex- special for Venice as well. Uh, y- y- yes, we, we were here. We spent the pandemic, the, the lockdown here, so it was an uh, incredible city that I, I, I know very well because uh, I was born not far from Venice and I studied for and lived uh, in Venice for 10 years uh, and now we are back here so I know very well the city but I have never seen the city like uh, like that so no people around totally empty and it was incredible in a way sad but also for us uh, exceptional because we, we could go to Piazza San Marco and other places where well, uh, we were alone, totally alone. And this is a kind of a dream to see the places like this. But uh, in a sense, it was really, really sad because uh, even if uh, Venice is, a, is, a, is, a, is a now uh, in this kind of evolution that you talk about, it is the evolution of Venice uh, since a uh, long time now is uh, it's to be a, a, a living museum. museum. So it's a place for tourists. The, the, the only economy in Venice is the tourism. So what's, what uh, the city like this is, is, is uh, obviously beautiful. Uh, you take some pictures, but after that, you feel really sadness. And you say, and uh, we, we, we started to make this film to understand what is the relationship between the, the body and, the, and, the, and the, the urban environment, but also the body and the other bodies of the people. And when you don't have a body in a place, you don't have a place. You, you, you don't have a space. You have just a, a, a dead city. So making a film during the pandemic, uh, during the lockdown, for example, uh, we said uh, we, we thought that uh, it, it is done in one day. So you just take some picture and anything is moving. There's no there's no movement. That's that's the problem of the pandemic. Is that uh, we cancel the movement. And the movement is the life, no? Life is movement. So it's like, a, it's like for me, Venice, uh, I, I always see Venice as a brain, no? And uh, we have the connection between all the neurons in this brain. If you cut the, the connection, uh, a brain without connection is just uh, a dead brain. So it's, uh, there's nothing to film in, uh, mm-hmm. during the pandemic. Uh, so we, we really wanted to see back the tourism uh, and the, we would we would love not to see only the tourism, uh, but uh, the, the life of Venice today is the tourist, and the tourists uh, are the connection, this kind of connection of this brain. So it's much better uh, watching uh, human beings moving than uh, empty city. I wanted to stop here, but you just uh, mentioned a very interesting word, which is brain, which brings me back to Sophia. Um, in your book, you talk about a sort of collective unconscious uh, of Venice. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes, um, a, a city is not a design product. It is, I mean, there are cities that are designed, uh, but the majority of the cities have evolved, particularly in, in, in Europe that have a long, long history, have evolved uh, by the collective actions of people. Uh, so that's what I meant by the collective unconscious, that um, they are products of creativity of people. Uh, but collective creativity of people Uh, and as architects because I'm trained as an architect and I am an architect academic as architects we are accustomed to think of the uh, things we design as the products of our creative activity but uh, who creates a city is a very interesting question and how the creativity of the city as a whole uh, relates to individual acts of creativity in the city, like the incredible works by Palladio or Sansovino or uh, any contemporary architect that has left a mark in Venice. So um, 
uh, I became interested in that and I think that uh, this is what makes our cities interesting, that uh, uh, interface and uh, collaboration and interaction between the, the collective creativity of the people and then uh, individual instances of creativity uh, that are, and these two types of creativity become influenced from each other. One inspires the other and vice versa. So when Sansovino reconfigures the Piazza San Marco, he's taking into consideration very important uh, arteries of the city and very important monuments in the city, existing monuments, and enhances them and enriches them, rather than really destroy the logic of the city that uh, uh, the, the inhabitants of the city created over long, long periods of time. Well, I would like to carry on with this conversation for another hour, really, but um, I think we have to uh, stop here for now. Um, I would like to end the conversation with uh, another two very short extract excerpt from um, uh, Omar Banus. And uh, after that, um, we'll have some time for the q and I can see some questions already. So let's watch it. I think this. I think these two uh, excerpts were very interesting, and uh, they underlined uh, very well part of the conversations that we had tonight. Um, there are a couple of questions from uh, the audience, um, and um, one question. I think it, it's uh, questions are open for to everyone. Um, Probably this one I'll uh, start with Becca Alemuan since you live in Venice. Um, there's uh, uh, a question where um, so people in Venice are ordering beers and taking self selfies among the floods. And uh, is there anything that we could do to raise a sense of urgency and prevent people from accepting the current crisis as normal? Do you think this is something that is necessary in Venice and can be done? It's open to everyone. And related to that, sorry about this, but uh, there's another question that is, uh, what are some potential versions of a new myth of Venice that could make us hopeful? Like, what, how can we, how can Venice in a way being uh, not only a cautionary tale, like, informing us of potential catastrophe coming over, but also being a, a sort of met, uh, a, a hopeful uh, symbol of how we can react and adapt to the future. 
do you think? I think Venice, in a way, can do that, right? It's probably the adaptability. It's the positive. It's not easy. Um, I think it's uh, obviously because of the um, mediatic attention, the importance of Venice in the world's uh, conscious, let's say, uh, the images of that high tide went through all the, uh, the the news all over the world. It was unbelievable how uh, those very striking images uh, were all over the, the front uh, head pages of uh, all the newspapers, the um, yeah, breaking news all over the world. And so to the point that I heard, it, it's quite funny that is some Americans thought that the Venice was uh, flooded forever. There was no more Venice existing on the map of Italy. You know, it's it's interesting how those striking images left such an impact in the, our collective unconscious that uh, to the point that you cannot remove those images anymore in some ways. No. So I think more than, uh, I don't know, the, than a campaign to, sense, to, um, to create consciousness of the tourists coming here, I think these, these uh, striking images going all over the world made that developed and contributed to that collective consciousness. And, and, uh, and they will not disappear so fast, I think. This is my, my personal intuition. Hmm? I... Yes, I, I, I agree. I think that personally, I'll add my opinion in this case. I think that uh, in a way, um, people adapting to the catastrophe is also a way of like, showing that we can survive and uh, so it's a it's a it's a double metaphor in a way it's like we have to raise consciousness but in the other is also a, a symbol that still we can adopt so let's work on the two sides of things in a way um there's an yeah. one powerful example perhaps comes from the time um where venice stopped uh, dominating the trading routes with the eastern mediterranean simply because of the discoveries of the new world and the circumnavigation of africa next day the banks in rialto collapsed so that must have been an extreme <laughs> shock for Venice. And what did they do? They actually took all their enterprises to the Veneto and through agricultural and um, irrigational projects, they really created new economies and new productive industries. So there have been lessons from the past, uh, including how they cope with environmental, environmental problems. Like uh, uh, if you read literature, environmental literature uh, uh, about Venice in the 16th century, the lagoon is portrayed as dying, as uh, the future of Venice being under threat because the stilting processes of the canals and the rivers were really creating challenges in the lagoon. And they engaged with big hydrological projects at that time. And this was something that was so central in the life of the city. The city was in continuous dialogue uh, with the environment and they were reconfiguring the entire landscape in the lagoon and in the Veneto. And this is what made Venice. Venice is not just the, the compact city, but it's the entire area. Uh, so I think that there are lessons from history that they can take. But one important aspect is governance. Who is in governance in the city and why certain things cannot be done so or can be done i don't know i'm not i'm not criticizing necessarily but that's a very very important thing and regarding a new myth i think that uh, the city can really um uh, create a, a new direction for itself that has to do with education perhaps and with culture uh, there is a great deal of uh, uh, productivity that the city has demonstrated already along that line um, th thanks for mentioning this, uh, Sophia. In, 
again in the um, in the podcast on episode we've written an episode called balance where we try to reconstruct and uh, the environmental history of venice and we really go through uh, what you just mentioned how the entire lagoon and the various island kind of adapted uh, to what was happening and this uh, connects me to the next question i can see here which is a question about torcello torcello is one of the islands in venice and uh, allegedly is the first uh, uh, I, um, island where, um, like Venetians, <laughs> uh, quotation marks, uh, installed. Uh, they lived there, they prospered there, uh, they were selling salt. Um, it was a huge, rich uh, situation, um, commerce, uh, and everyone was going there. But like they, at a certain point, the balance between, uh, you know, like commerce, the economic and and uh, and the environment, like the balance at a certain point started to move the wrong way and it was there was no balance anymore. Silt like the river silted and uh, and uh, various um, maladies started like uh, circulating in the island. People left the island and they moved to what is currently Rialto. And that is the, the secondary, uh, installment and then like the, the new civilization of Venice started there and you know like Venice is now facing another change so um, this idea of like movement and adaptation is really interesting historically and uh, but also right now as we speak as we face what is happening um, the question I will read that although we partly answered it is um uh, am I wrong that Torcello was the first island populated in the lagoon? And the answer is uh, no, it's correct. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, this person is interested in the transition to current areas. So Torcello was, uh, was very populated and it is hardly lived on now. Um, but now it, it, it is a big show place with a, a showy church and a showy restaurant. Uh, it's really uh, a sort of uh, boutique uh, in a way. Um, what happened there? Was that, was that due to physical wateriness? Um, I, yes, I would say that that is the reason. But in a way, Torcello represents what has happened to Venice. Can we say that? Like from being a very rich and powerful island to now being a city that is visited by tourists with like a show. What? Maybe Ila, that lived for 10 years in Venice, knows more about it. Yeah, uh, yeah I, don't, I, I, I haven't understood the, the question, but I, I, it makes me think about, about uh, something that you can find in Torcello is the throne of Attila, no? the Attila throne. And uh, this is remind me that uh, uh, Venice, uh, not really, really at the beginning, but uh, just uh, some years after, in, uh, I, I, if I, I'm not wrong, in uh, 400, 451, I don't know if, if I'm right, but uh, when Attila arrived uh, in, in Italy, in, uh, it was obviously not Italy, but uh, here, all the all the citizens from uh, they live there in the in this area escape to the lagoon just to find uh, a solution to escape to Attila that was uh, obviously very known to be a very cruel man and so Venice started like an adaptation like this so they they started to adapt themselves to live uh, in the in the in the water because uh, Attila had uh, uh, the army. Attila's army was uh, on the on the, uh, the, the, the no they they were cavaliers they were on the horses, and the horses couldn't go to on the water. So all the all the people escaping from Attila uh, tried to uh, find a solution going to, in the, this uh, archipelago of uh, island uh, in 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 between the water. So Venice uh, started to to. Um, to exist like this is a kind of really big adaptation. So they they had to 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 to, to know how to adapt to to, to the, this new life to live in uh, with the water. They didn't know how to do it, and so starting from there is a kind of uh, adaptation. Venice is adaptation. In Torcello, you can find the symbol of that. No, even I think it's fake. No, it's not uh, the, the the real one. But. Uh, 
is this just to finish with this idea of uh, adaptation that could be interesting is uh, Venice could be is uh, for me is not a symbol of uh, what is happening in the world because Venice is a very is an exception is a, is not a city like the others it's totally an exception so even in a total catastrophe even when uh, the, the world will be finishing venice will be there because uh, <laughs> because people want to go to venice even with two two meters of uh, water in the venice, in venice uh, you will still find people taking se selfies in venice so that's in piazza san marco under the water so i i, I don't think we can take uh, venice as a, an example of uh, uh, adaptation to catastrophe but we can take venice as a, an, a symbol uh, of the, uh, the the high le the, the level the sea level rising yes this we we can see it and if you come in Venice, you see the water is rising. But uh, I think maybe even, even with, uh, and you can see it in our film, even with the high tide and a lot of water in the city, everything is going well. Um, <clears throat> Economically. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this, uh, this brought, something else to my mind about uh, Venice. Um, perhaps it's it's exceptional and it can't be taken as a, as a you know as an example. but I think it is really like a place where we can see how all these different emergencies that we are facing come together in a very very visible way. And sometimes we need some, like facing something visibly because uh, like talking about tourism and economy and global warming, I'm thinking sometimes about global warming and uh, the cultural, our cultural heritage, what is the relationship between the two of them. Sometimes if we think about them just theoretically, it can be difficult to grasp the relationship, but in Venice it's just there in front of your face. And when the water rises and you see that an institution is, is invaded by water and the archives are damaged and all of that, you realize that, yes, that is a physical event, but it tells us about things and about relationships. So it can be taken theoretically to reflect on things. So yeah, perhaps now, it's, yeah. Now, now they know how to adapt themselves also for the archive because now they know that they don't have to put it on the on the on, on the floor, you know. So yeah. there's, there's a yeah. This is something that you learn very quickly that uh, you you cannot. You, we have a, a, a sort of cave. Uh, um, it's not a cave. It's just a room uh, on the floor. Uh, on the a storage. Uh, a storage. And now we know that we don't have to leave things. Uh, and uh, a, a kind of uh, yeah, one meter sixty, one meter or, 60 or like this. So you, it's uh, yeah. It's, uh, 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 what what I wanted to, to say is that I agree totally with you. It is very interesting, uh, Venice, but uh, it's uh, it's a, a big exception. So it's uh, we can understand a lot about the global warming, but at the end, uh, we I, I don't think that Venice will die a day. It, uh, is uh, is not uh, is not a city that in in first because I say this because there's a lot of people saying ah it's a pity Venice will die will will die, will not exist in thirty years in twenty years in forty years I I, I don't know and uh, I'm I'm not so sure that we can uh, use this model uh, for this city we, we maybe we need a, a, a Venetian model only for this city an exception city. I think that is also connected to um, how we talk about, uh, which is another interesting topic, probably not for tonight, but uh, how we can talk about uh, uh, environmental emergencies, like this idea of catastrophe as opposed to, you know, more positive, I don't know if positive is the right word, but different narratives. We probably need to find different narratives as well as, you know, collective solutions as well. Because this idea of the uh, apocalypse or the catastrophe coming over is uh, is not working really. Um, I think that Ella's last words about Venice will never die uh, are <laughs> great. 
uh, conclusion to our night and uh, keep Venice alive in, you know, like in our world, but also in our spirits from for, for us here in London and uh, you in Venice. Um, I would like to thank everyone for um, uh, your great insight tonight, for having uh, offered us some excerpts from your film. Your film, uh, let me remind our audience, are available on uh, through your website and Vimeo. Um, the entire collection is uh, available, the, the entire 10 films from Homo Urbanus and uh, in particular the chapter uh, on Venice. Sophia's book, uh, the, various, the Venice Variations, is also available uh, as open access online. Um, and uh, I would like to thank you again and uh, hope to drink a spritz in Venice one day <laughs> all together. <laughs> That sounds yeah. like a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> good idea. Good idea. Uh, good idea. 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 Good idea